Hey family, welcome to the official YouTube page of One. I'm excited that you're here. This message is getting ready to bless your life. I want you to stay connected to the incredible things that are happening in this movement. So don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications. And if you want to partner with us in some of the great things that we're doing all over the world, you can give as well. Now it's time to get into this word. I love you. God bless you. Let's stay connected. There is absolutely nothing like being a part of a community that you know is literally striving to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I love what God is doing here through One Online, but most importantly, what I love is the transformation connected to this movement. I don't know about you, but even as I began to lift my hands in worship, I realized that this worship that I was experiencing from the team is something that I could tap into even when the team isn't present. And it is that knowing and that leading and that urging from the Holy Spirit that allows worship during Activate to just be the icing on the cake of what's already happening in my world. I want to encourage you, and we love that you plug in with us Thursday and that you catch every single second of what God is doing. But I want to encourage you to not let worship in just because the music is done, but to take this heart of worship and allow it to continue to be with you no matter where you go from this season, that heart of worship will fill you up in the same way. Child, I was singing in the car a cappella, and I know it sounded terrible, but it was so pure. It was from my heart, and I just thank God that I've come to a space where I don't mind, even if the performance isn't well, because my heart is in the right place, that I can connect with the presence of God. I'm so excited about what God's going to do through this word. I was praying and If you have not been connected to this series about evidence, I have to tell you, you are really missing out. Like, I don't like FOMO, but I'm telling you, you need to have a case of FOMO because PT has been just laying down the word week after week after week. On Sunday, he preached about faith, and it got me so together that I wanted to share with you not just what I took from the message, but how it challenged me and what God said in response. I love being under PT's leadership because I always know that I'm going to leave with a word that is literally going to confront where my weaknesses are, but also introduce an opportunity for strength. I took that word into my prayer closet and I came out with a word that I think is going to bless you. God knows it blessed me. My subject is wrestling doubt, wrestling doubt. And I'm going to be in Exodus, Exodus 4 and 1. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I've got a lot of text here, but my prayer is that it'll make perfect sense when everything is said and done. Exodus 4 and 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And my text says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, God says, to cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be if they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take your water from the river and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. He gave three signs. I should have given you a little bit of background for those of you unfamiliar with this text. Moses has 
uh, born in Egypt. He was born in Egypt and he fled from Egypt because he was a Hebrew child born in Egypt. And he's been in this place where he fled for 40 years and God has this conversation with him. And yet God says something to him that is so unfathomable that requires so much faith that he could not help but experience doubt. I want to speak to you with that in mind. Spirit of the living God, man, some of us know all too well what it's like to wrestle with doubt. To wonder how in the world could you choose me to do something that requires this much faith? God, if we're honest, somebody's watching tonight and faith is too much of a stretch. They've been living in this space of doubt for so long that it has become comfortable. But Father, you gave me this word for my own doubt. And because it brought me great breakthrough, God, I am believing that there is an impartation that's going to happen in the spirit realm. That even though we are not in the same room, we are in the same presence, God. Because your presence is with me and your presence is with them, we are in the same presence. And in your presence, there will be a fulfillment of every area where we have experienced brokenness. Let your glory fall as only it can do. And as your glory falls, God, let it confront the areas of our heart where there is doubt. Make us tender, God. Make us aware. Help us to see the areas where we've just pulled back. But may this message propel us forward, even if it means stretching us. God, I thank you that this is your word. These are your people. This is your moment. So let there be none of me, only you. Your word standing tall on the inside of me. Because I have no doubt that if you step into the room, change is the only outcome. If you step into the room, transformation is the only outcome. So be with them, God, in that car, in that office, in that living room, in that kitchen, God, meet them where they need you the most and walk with them, God, until they become one with you and can say thank you on the other side of eternity. In Jesus name. Amen. I don't know if you're watching Activate for the first time, but there is a rule where you have to type amen in the comments or the prayer is not sealed. So I'm going to need you to drop that amen in the comments. You know, I was studying about doubt in preparation for this message. Maybe I don't know if I should tell you about how I started studying about doubt or why I started studying about doubt. I started studying about doubt because when I was listening to PT's message about faith, it was so good to my soul. Like it, I mean the insight connected to it, the standing under and then over, like some of these things won't make any sense until you actually watch the message. But I was so challenged by that word that I started asking God, where are the areas of my life where I need to have an increase of faith? I think that that's always something that we have to be willing to ask ourselves. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how long you've been in church. If you aren't asking yourself, God, what is the area of my life that needs an increase of faith? You're not in relationship with God, you're in religion. But to be in relationship with God is to say, this word has resonated with me so greatly. What area of my life is it watering? Because I want to understand where to look for growth. When a word comes into your heart, when it comes into your spirit, it comes into your mind, and you just can't shake it off. And it's not just like, oh, that was a good word. It's something that sticks with you. You have to be willing to ask God, what is the area in my life that this word is watering? Because I want to see when the seed starts sprouting. I want to see when that seed begins to turn into fruit. God, this word is watering me. And I kept asking God, what's happening? And he told me through my prayer and meditation, he was like, you've got doubt. And I didn't understand why he would say that to me because I didn't really know where the area of my doubt was. But the more that I began to study and dig into this word, I realized that I had been living in a place of doubt in one particular area for so long that doubt had, became, had become home for me. Yeah, me. I think it's important that we have authenticity and transparency in our relationship, right? Because I'm not telling you that I'm the standard. I'm telling you that I'm on a journey just like you are. And I received a word and this word illuminated an area of my life where I've had doubt for so long that it's become comfortable. This word doubt, I want to define it for you. The word doubt 
means a feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction. A feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction. I would have never considered doubt as being a feeling of uncertainty. Because when I feel uncertain, I just feel uncertain. I don't necessarily say that I am doubting something, but I feel like this definition helps me to understand that in seasons of uncertainty, the uncertainty is probably also connected to this doubt. If I feel uncertain about whether or not I should start a business, there's probably a doubt that says, I don't know if I could succeed as a business owner. If I feel uncertain about whether or not I should apologize, it's because I have some kind of doubt that me apologizing may change the way the other person sees me. There is something to be said about uncertainty having connected to it this layer and level of doubt. I started beginning to process my own life, and I recognized that doubt has a subtle introduction into our lives. And I was thinking about how God was convicting me about my own doubt, I began to recognize how the enemy uses doubt is subtle. It's never blatant, but it's subtle in that it relocates you from a place of conviction to a place of uncertainty. And if God can get you into a place of conviction, then he knows I can get any word to you and you'll move based off of that word. But if the enemy can get you into a place where you have a lack of conviction, you'll just start floating through life when you're supposed to be taking charge, having dominion and subduing the earth. That's why doubt is dangerous. I want to let you know something. Doubt is not something we should take lightly. Doubt is not something that we should just adjust to. Doubt is a threat to your destiny. That's why the serpent comes in and he's talking to the woman and he says to the woman, did God really say, I don't have to tell you to eat from the fruit. I don't have to lure you with anything that's going to make you greater than where you are right now. All I have to do is introduce doubt. If I introduce doubt, you'll be open to anything. If I introduce doubt, you'll start questioning what God said. If I introduce doubt, then you'll become a double-minded man, unstable in all of your ways. Am I talking to anybody who understands what it's like to have doubt? I know that I should, but I also don't believe that I can. I know that I can, but I don't know how. And so I'm double-minded. I'm living in a space of doubt. I don't know who you are, but I want you to recognize that that doubt is a weapon against your destiny. That doubt is trying to change the way that you see God. That doubt is trying to change the way that you show up in the earth. That doubt is trying to make you no longer live with conviction because when you live with conviction, you are a weapon. When you live with conviction, anything you do has God's DNA on it. There's something dangerous about someone who lives with conviction. I told God when I was studying for this word, God, don't just give me a word. Give me conviction about what this word can do. And that's the way we've got to show up in our relationships. I want a relationship that I can show up to with conviction. I want to be in a ministry where I can show up to that ministry with conviction, where I believe down on the inside of me that I am aligned. I know exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm saying exactly what I'm supposed to say because I'm aligned with conviction. Conviction brought me here. I didn't want to be here, but conviction kept pushing me. I didn't want to say it, but conviction kept pushing me. Is there anyone in this space that knows what it's like to live a life of conviction? That conviction will change you. That conviction will have you looking in the mirror and you don't even recognize who you are anymore because conviction changed my identity. Conviction changed the way that I saw myself. Conviction changed what I thought was possible. Conviction started making me think that it didn't matter what I went through that God was still pushing me conviction is when God starts pushing you in your back and instead of you resisting you start moving in the direction of what God is doing God I feel you pushing me God I feel you stirring me that's conviction working through you it's moving you in the direction of your destiny somebody needs to start praying for conviction God convict me until I change my ways God convict me until I don't care what I look like when I do it God convict me until I care more about what you think than what other people think somebody's got to start praying for conviction because nothing changes without conviction nothing is transformed without conviction when you get a conviction down on the inside of you it doesn't matter what who what anybody says to you because the conviction is in me you can say what you want to but conviction is in me you can do what you want to but conviction is in me I messed around and got some conviction so to live in doubt It's to live with a lack of conviction. It's to flow through life, letting life happen to you. 
And I hear God saying that conviction cuts through the noise. Conviction elevates your perspective. Conviction, conviction helps you to navigate the tough moments. It makes survival a necessity, not a luxury. I got to survive this because someone is counting on me. This is why you have to be careful who you're connected to. Because when you're trying to protect your conviction, you can't expose yourself to other people's doubt. Doubt is contagious. And all of a sudden, you'll go from feeling convicted to feeling weak. And now their doubt has become your disease, and you couldn't protect your conviction, and you're both sitting here stagnant. But just like doubt is contagious, baby, so is conviction. Have you ever been working out to next to somebody who was going so hard like they was training for the Olympics? And you thought to yourself, if you're going to go that hard, I'm going to go that hard too. Conviction, oh my God, I want to thank God for a minute, for the people who came into my life and took my conviction to the next level. Now I want to be holy in the way that I see you striving for holiness. Now I want to be righteous in the way I see you right, r- striving for righteousness. There's something powerful about being connected to the contagious nature of conviction. So you got to know when doubt has become your home. You're watching this message and maybe doubt isn't your home in one area of your life. But I want you to be open to the possibility that doubt has become your home in another area of your life. And I want you to consider what it would look like if we just focused in for 20 minutes and you let me speak to that area of doubt. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? God, bring it to the surface. (laughs) God, you didn't just give me this word so that we can listen to it and go back to being the same. God, I want you to bring that area of doubt to the surface so that we can have deliverance. Oh, God, I feel your power so that we can have deliverance from that area of doubt. I hear God saying that somebody's going to listen to this message and they're never going to battle with doubt again, that someone's going to listen to this message and they're going to recognize how to fight back when it comes to doubt again. I hear God saying that somebody's been drowning in doubt and somebody's getting ready to just let go and allow doubt to have the final say. But I hear God saying that he wouldn't and let you go out that way. And this word is going to pull you out. If that's your word, I want you to type, I receive it, I receive it, I receive it. There's a lifeline headed your direction. There's a next level of salvation headed your direction. You got saved from the world, but God said, now I want to save you from what got in you when you were in the world. I want to save you from the mindsets that got implanted in you while you were in the world. And doubt is one of them. Let's get into this word. Moses is struggling with doubt. Moses, the same Moses that was born in the realm of faith is now struggling with doubt. Moses' mother gave birth to him at a time when he was supposed to be killed for being a boy. And yet his mother had faith for his life. And because she had faith for his life, she partnered with God to create an opportunity for him to escape death. He was born in the realm of faith. Isn't it interesting how what starts with faith can end in doubt? A lot of times God allows us to feel enough faith to get started, but it doesn't feel like enough faith to sustain the journey. Has anyone ever come to a place where their faith needs a refill? It's one thing when you have enough faith for God doing or changing what you know is wrong in your life. But what do you do when something starts off with faith? I knew it was God. I know that God put me in this position. I know that God allowed me to be a part of this family. But now what started with faith is now ending in doubt. Now I'm doubting myself. I I felt so confident about who I was. I felt so confident about this ministry, confident about this word. And now what started in faith, there's this moment, guys, when I'm preaching 
speaking sometimes. And I feel so on fire when I'm praying for the word. And I feel so on fire when I close that laptop. But there is a moment on this stage where I start off in faith and I realize that if I don't show up in the fullness of who I am, then the part of me that doubts that I should be up here will come up here and hijack this message. How is it that I start in faith but I end in doubt? And I just wanted you to know that it is not uncommon to start with faith and then end with doubt. But I hear God saying that you get to choose if doubt is the end. That you get to choose whether or not you're going to keep pressing forward and clear your mind so that the Holy Ghost can flow through you in a fresh new way. I hear God saying that even though you started in faith and you found yourself in a place of doubt, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit can't reach down in that doubt and pull you right on out of the grasp of the enemy. Doubt is a trick of the enemy trying to make you believe that you are not who God has called you to be. Doubt is a trick of the enemy trying to make you feel that you are inadequate for what God has called you to do. But when you come to a place where you say, I'm going to start doubting myself, but I'm not going to doubt what God says. I'm going to doubt me because I'm trying to talk myself out of this. I'm going to doubt me because I'm trying to convince myself I don't belong here. But when I put that doubt on me, it means I'm putting faith on God. I can't trust every thought I have about myself. I can't trust every plan that I have for myself. I've got more doubt on me, but I got more faith with God because of the doubt that I put on myself. I want to talk to some real people today, not those people who say that they always think the right thoughts and they never run out of faith. I want to talk to somebody who needs to start doubting themselves. I know it's against what culture says. I know you'll never see this posted on Instagram, but I'm telling you there are moments in your life when you need to doubt yourself because you will sleep on you. You will talk yourself out of destiny. You will convince yourself that you don't belong, but when you say, I'm going to believe what God says, I'm going to move forward in the direction that God has called me to be, you'll be standing in rooms that you couldn't even imagine because God's faith God's trust, God's picture of who you are led you when your own doubt was trying to hold you captive. Moses, born a Hebrew, started in the realm of faith, but he couldn't quite figure out how do I navigate being Hebrew in my ethnicity, but being Egyptian in my upbringing. And he tried to balance it and tried to navigate it for about 40 years until he came to a place where he decided to move away from the place of doubt. Oh, God, help me to say it the way I studied it. Doubt can be so expensive that instead of leaning into doubt, we choose instead to live in such a way that the doubt doesn't scare us. God, I want to avoid doubt by any means necessary. And because I want to avoid doubt by any means necessary, I'm going to relocate myself from where you place me. Because sometimes God places us in environments and circumstances that make us question who we are. The goal is that we would question who we are and receive who God says we are. But because we can't survive the questioning of who we are, we leave the relationship. We leave the job. We leave the ministry because you're causing me to feel so doubtful about myself that I'm going to move away from this place that is meant to transform me. Oh, I hear God saying that somebody left because you started doubting yourself. And I hear God saying that if you would have stayed in position a little bit longer, you would have seen that doubt was the womb that I was going to use for transformation to bring about faith that you never experienced. I hear God saying that sometimes you got to wrestle with doubt. Sometimes you got to wrestle doubt down to the ground until faith comes up and says, I had to wrestle you down right here. Oh God, I feel like riffing because this don't have anything to do with my note. But when Moses left, he gave up territory. When no, when Moses left, he gave up identity. And God says, I'm not going to allow you to stay away from the place that is meant to transform you. I don't know who you are, but I hear God saying that you've got to go back to that place where you gave up so that you can recognize that until you wrestle that doubt that's down on the inside of you, then power cannot be released through you. You got to wrestle that doubt down to the ground because if you don't wrestle that doubt down, it's going to pull you away from where God can use you. I know you don't feel qualified. I know you don't think you're ready, but I hear God saying that's just your doubt talking. And I hear God saying that you got to start wrestling with doubt. You got to start putting your paws on doubt. 
doubt. You got to start speaking back to doubt and letting doubt know you may be right, but I'm going to stay here because it's where God placed me. You may be right, but I'm going to stay positioned here because God called me here in this moment. I feel like prophesying in this place. I feel like going something crazy in this place because God's calling me out of my own town. And God told me, Sarah, if you come out of town, I still haven't seen what you can do. You still haven't heard what will come out of you, but you got to wrestle that doubt down to the ground. You got to get a hold of that doubt. Stop running from it and start looking at it head on. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm going to have a standoff with doubt because doubt cannot stand in the presence of God. I feel the presence of God in this place. Doubt's got to let somebody go. I'm not even talking to you anymore. I want to talk to your doubt. I want to talk to that thing that's down on the inside of you that keeps pulling you back, that keeps making you question yourself, that makes you want to quit and you just got started. How could you quit and I haven't even gotten you to the finish line yet? Doubt you can't stay here. Doubt you gotta let her go. Doubt you gotta get your hands off of him. It is a trick of the enemy. And I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I prophesy in the name of Jesus that every stronghold is gonna come down. Every mental paradigm that keeps making you feel that doubt. You are that anointed. You are that appointed. You are the one for the job and no one else can do it but you. It is you and you alone. And until you get rid of that doubt, you may see progress, but you you won't see transformation because the transformation can't come until you wrestle with doubt. Moses has got to wrestle this thing down. Moses has got to wrestle this thing down because he's got to be in position. The time has come. Who are you? Who are you watching this message? The time has come for him to step into the fullness of who he is. The time has come for him to realize why he had to be saved when other people couldn't be saved. You've been wondering, God, why me? I'm no different. I'm no special than anyone else. And God says, stop asking me questions and step into it. The time has come for you to step into this thing. It's time for you to come out of that land of unbelief. It's time for you to come out of that land of comfort. It's time for you to become and bring your doubt with you because God's got an answer for that I don't think I can do it God says bring your doubt with you I got something for that. Bring your pain with you. Bring your second guessing with you. I got something for that. When I get finished with you, there will be no doubt. When God gets finished with you, there will be no doubt that God was with you every step of the way. That the weapons were formed, but they didn't prosper. God says, when I get done, they'll have to let you go. And Moses, Moses is stepping into something. And he's bringing his doubt with him. Y'all, I've been preaching for a few years now. But I've been preaching with doubt. I've been preaching with doubt. And I brought my doubt with me, but I still said yes. I brought my doubt with me, but we still went on tours. I brought my doubt with me, but I still had a conference because the answer to doubt is faith in action. And every time I kept pushing, I wanted doubt to know that you couldn't dictate who I was going to be. You're going to have to come and sit in the audience while I tell these women to refuse to lose. Doubt is going to have to come and sit in the audience while I tell the nations to activate. Doubt, I'm going to take you with me everywhere God takes me. And I'm going to let you come with me because when God gets finished there will be no doubt <sighs> Moses gets ready to go I'm packing up my doubt and I'm gonna move to that city I'm packing up my doubt and I'm gonna go back to that place I'm packing up my doubt and I'm gonna be your mouthpiece I'm packing up my doubt but God I just have a few questions what am I gonna do if they don't believe me God you finally convinced me 
But what about them? What if the very people I'm called to don't believe that you called me? God says, I'm going to give you three weapons, three tools to use when you have to wrestle with the doubt connected to your call. (laughs) Three weapons, three weapons. I'm going to give them to you real fast. God says to Moses, and if you're taking notes, this might be what you want to write down. This is what I want to stick with us more than anything. God says to Moses, well, first I'll say, Moses asks, what am I going to say if they don't believe me? And God doesn't give Moses words to say back. If I say, God, what am I supposed to say? I'm expecting for God to give me something to say. God doesn't give him words. He gives him action. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Just focus on what I give you to do. Your greatest ability to hush your naysayers has nothing to do with what you say back and everything to do with what you act on as it relates to what God gave you. God gives them something to act on. If you want to silence the doubt, God says, act on it. So he gives him, he says, that staff that's in your hand. The first weapon that Moses is going to use to wrestle doubt is already in his hand. He says, take that staff that's in your hand. He didn't have to gather anything. He didn't have to go and get someone. He didn't have to go meet someone. It's already in your hand. Your weapon for doubt is already in your hand. And he says, take that and throw it on the ground. Take what's in your hand. My question was, when did Moses get this staff? Because I wanted to understand how did Moses come to a place where he already had it in his hand because I want you to understand how you've come to a place where you already have it in your hand. What you're gonna use, what God is going to allow you to use to fight doubt is already in your hand. And God simply told me he picked it up along the way. That's so good to me because a lot of times we think that the things that we've picked up along the way, the experiences that we have picked up along the way cannot be used for what God is calling us to. As a matter of fact, if we're honest, some of us believe the fact that we picked up some things along the way is exactly why we have a reason to doubt because if you knew what I picked up along the way, then you would know that I shouldn't be standing here. But God says, I want you to understand that I can use what you picked up along the way. Whose word is that? You've picked up some things along the way, some things that look useful, some things that have made your heart hard, some things that don't even make sense. God, why would you have me work in that job? God says, because I needed you to pick it up along the way. God, why would you take me through that relationship and then allow it to break me? God says, because I needed you to pick up some things along the way. Because when you take what you picked up along the way and throw it at something, you'll see the power connected to what you picked up along the way. God, help me. It doesn't matter what you picked up along the way. What matters the most is how you throw it at what God is doing. When you throw it at what God is doing, you'll start reaching people you could have never reached and they'll wonder, how did you do it? How did you connect with those people? And you'll know it's just something that I picked up along the way. The weapon for your doubt is in the experiences that you picked up along the way. When you use those experiences, don't don't hoard them. Because so often we hoard those experiences, we hoard those lessons, we just keep them tucked away on the inside thinking they have no value. But it wasn't until Moses threw it at something that he saw that it was more than what he thought it was. As a matter of fact, it scared him when he threw that staff to the ground. When I was studying that part of the message, God said to me specifically that there's somebody who's going to be connected to this word and you're going to be shocked at what happens when you throw what God gave you into the direction of what God is doing. God, I didn't know that you could use this for that. 
God, I didn't know that you could take the foolish things of the world. God, I didn't know that you could do that. I didn't know that you could use this for that. I didn't know that you could use my past for my present. God, I didn't know that that pain was going to turn to purpose. God, I didn't know that you were going to take that heartbreak and turn it into transformation. How could you turn it into ministry? How could you turn it into a business? God says, what you picked up along the way will help to silence your doubt. The second thing he does... You remember the text, he put his hand in his bosom and he pulled it out and it was leprosy. And then he put his hand back in his bosom and he pulled it out and it was clean. The weapons that we are going to use to fight doubt, it is one already in our hand and two already in our hand. It's you're holding it and you are it. You've gone through it, but you are it. I'm just going to tell you all my business. This is activate slash getting to know Pastor Sarah. When I was asking God, how did this message apply to me? God kept saying that teen pregnancy that you think made your ministry was just what was in your hand. It was the staff. And my doubt resonates with me. Because it is me thinking that it had it not been for that teen pregnancy that, that I wouldn't have an anointing. That had it not been for what I'd gone through, that I wouldn't have any power, any glory, or the ability to help other people. And God says, you keep saying that. And as long as you believe that story, then you'll think that you're here because of what's in your hand. But I just want you to understand that it's not just what's in your hand. It's what I put down on the inside of you too. And what you went through just broke open the seal. I want to talk to somebody who's been thinking that the only reason why you're in this room is because of a connection. The only reason why you've got this opportunity opportunity is because of something that you've gone through. And I hear God saying that it's time to cancel the struggle Olympics, that I anointed everybody that I put in this earth. And what's happened to you is just broken open the seal of what I already placed down on the inside of you. I wish I could say that thing the way that I feel it. But I heard, I heard God tell me when I was studying this message, you are anointed before you got pregnant. I predestined this moment for your life. That pregnancy was just helping to crack open the seal. This is important for someone to understand because you'll continue to believe that something needs to happen to you in order for you to be anointed. And I hear God saying, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. You were anointed before you ever went through it. And you will be anointed if you never go through it again. You don't have to go through struggle in order to be anointed. That that struggle that you go through is just going to pop the oil for the anointing that's already in you. That oil is already down on the inside of you. So anytime you start that olive already has oil in it the crushing produces what's already in it you were already gifted you were already talented just because someone got you into the room just because you had an experience doesn't mean that the experience put it in you God put that gift in you God put that oil in me God put that anointing down on the inside of me and everything that happened for me was just cracking open the seal and anytime you get in some struggle I want you to start recognizing that God must have some more oil down on the inside of me. God must have something else that he put down on me. God, crack it open. God, break it open because it's already in you. It's not just what you do with your hand. It is your hand itself. I can't move past this point until I get it or somebody gets it. I'm going to preach myself out of doubt and I'm going to take someone else with me. God said, I put that down on the inside of you before they even knew you were coming into the world. You've got a divine date with destiny. Moses didn't become Moses when he stepped back into Egypt. He was born a deliverer. You were born that way. You were born compassionate. You were born sensitive. You were born that communicator. God said, I gave that to you. So don't make it become something that was produced as a result of experiences when it started in heaven. It started in heaven. And what happened along the way, what you picked up along the way, is an extension of what's already in you. It's difficult to come to a place where you just trust that who you are in God 
is enough with no additions. Imagine if Moses was standing in front of Pharaoh, but he didn't have his staff. He would think to himself, I can't show up in this moment because I don't have my staff. God wanted him to know before he even stood in front of Pharaoh. It's not just in his staff. It's in him. What is your crutch that you have come to believe makes you who you are? What is that crutch that you're carrying that you feel like if I don't have it, then I can't show up in this moment? I was about to come out and preach and I don't have my childhood Bible with me. And God says, you don't have to have your childhood Bible in order to deliver what I gave you to say. That's your crutch. I feel like God is bringing us to a place where we can stand flat footed in our identity and believe that it is enough without any doubt. I know you don't want to do it without that person you lost, but that person was an extension of the anointing. It was not the extent of the anointing. I know you don't want to face that room. I know you don't want to face this new life. I know you don't want to step into this new identity without the things that have become your staff, your support system. But God says, just as they were anointed to be your staff, you are anointed to be you. Do you hear me? You are anointed to be who God is calling you to be. And you've got to be willing to come out of that place of doubt and trust God's opinion over your own. To, just, to trust God's power over the power of doubt. My challenge for myself, and maybe it's the challenge for you too, is to stop believing that the anointing happened on accident or that the anointing is just temporary but to fully embrace the fact that it's just in me it's just in me it, it's always been in me there wasn't just this moment where God says I'm gonna deposit it the anointing that God placed on your life was not an afterthought it wasn't a consolation prize. Whose word is this? It's my word. Who, who else? The gift was not a consolation prize. That because you didn't get X, Y, and Z, I'm going to give you anointing. That anointing was there before the trauma ever happened. And if you don't come out of the place of doubt, you'll think that you only need trauma in order to progress. Instead of recognizing that the trauma just broke the seal open. The third thing, I'm almost out of time. It's very easy, very simple. Then I'm going to pray with you. The third sign that God gives Moses to fight his doubt with. He says, you won't get it until you go. He said, it'll be in the river. You're not standing by a river, but I've got provision connected to where you're headed that will help you fight the doubt when you get there. When you get to the place, when you finally muster up the courage to trust what's in your hand and to trust what's in you, you'll still have opportunity for doubt. But if you stay close to the river, the river is the other weapon for doubt. In my text, it says that you'll take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. And the water which you take from the river will become blood on dry land. God was telling Moses, if you stay close to the river, you'll be close enough to fight against doubt. I got to stay close to the river, guys. The river is where I fight the doubt. The same river that carried you into safety, Moses. 
that same river that preserved your life 80 years ago. It's that same river that's going to help you fight against doubt. When you came to know the Lord, maybe somebody's watching and this is just you dipping your toe in the river. Someone else is watching and you know where the river is, but you lost your way somewhere along the way. God says, I want you to come into the river. I want you to live your life in such a way that you can trust the movement of the river, that you can pull from the river anytime that you need a reminder that doubt cannot have the final say. God, what is our river? The river we have is through Jesus. The closer I stay to Jesus, the more weapons I have against doubt. Jesus says in the New Testament that he who believes in him, that there will be rivers of living water flowing through our belly. So when I stay close to Jesus, I stay close to the river. And I need to be close to the river because I'm wrestling with doubt. I'm going with, I'm going with wherever God takes me, but sometimes my doubt is coming too. Sometimes there's new doubt along the way. I only had enough faith to get here, but I didn't realize how hard it was going to be when I got here. And now I have new doubt based off of the landscape that I see. But when I stay close to the river, the new doubt doesn't scare me. I want to give you tools, family, for every season, every stage of life. And those tools come down to those three things that God gave Moses. Don't you love that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? Because those same tools that God gave Moses are the tools that he has available to us as well. That when we throw what we picked up along the way in the direction of what God is doing, that there will be no doubt that God is with us. How are you using those experiences? How are you using that talent? How are you using those lessons you learned along the way? Certainly there's a nonprofit somewhere that could benefit from it. Certainly there's a ministry, there's a person, there's a soul that could benefit from what you picked up along the way. What about owning our identity, trusting in who we are? That's a weapon too where you don't feel like you don't have what it takes just because you don't have what it took. <laughs> Moses used that staff to get him there. But God says, I could just send you without this staff and accomplish my will. You gotta trust who God says you are. But that last thing, the river is a decision that requires faith. Do you believe that if you stay connected with God, that you'll always have the ability to wrestle and win against doubt. If I follow the steps of Jesus, if I allow the Holy Spirit to lead me, I'll always have access to the ultimate weapon against doubt. I want to pray with you. If it's okay, I'm going to pray in reverse. I'm not going to pray that you come to a place where you recognize what's in your hand or you recognize who you are. I'm going to pray instead that you would simply stay close to the river. So if you stay close to the river, you'll have everything you need. You'll have a mirror, you'll have trees planted by living waters to make a staff when you need it. You'll have perspective on what you've gone through, you'll have peace, you'll have comfort, you'll have joy. Most importantly, you will experience the absence of doubt. I wanna pray with you, Spirit, Spirit of the living God. <laughs> you are the river. 
And you sent this word as a river to run through our fears, to run through our doubt, to confront our situation and our circumstance, God. We acknowledge that this is not just a word, it is a river. And it is meant to move us and change us and transform us. Father, we repent in the holiest, most sacred way. God, I believe doubt over what I believed from you. God, I believe fear over what I believed from you. God, I repent for giving my doubt more power than you've granted it. God, the truth is I'm just scared. The truth is we were just nervous to get it wrong. God, the truth is that we were just nervous that we couldn't take another heartbreak. We were calling it nerves, but you call it doubt. We were calling it fear, but you call it doubt. God, if it's doubt, then we say, yes, we've been feeling uncertain. And in moments we've had a lack of conviction, but you sent this word and it confronted us. And we wanna move to a place of certainty. Jesus, I thank you that you're meeting each and every last one of my brothers and sisters right where they need it right now. And that as you meet with them, that you are meeting them with compassion and conviction. Conviction that says it's time to move. Conviction that says it's time to grow. Conviction that says step into it. You've got this. Step into it. You won't do it alone. Step into it. Heaven has already gone ahead of you. Step into it. This is a part of why God has created you. I hear you cheering us on, Jesus. Thank you for being in our cheering section. Jesus, thank you for making intercession on our behalf. Jesus, thank you for calling this doubt out and putting it on the table so we can finally deal with it and we see it and we don't want it to stay with us any longer. So spirit of the living God, we make a demand on doubt and we rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. We destroy it right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, let your power fall as only it can do. We are covered in the blood, and if we are covered in the blood, then doubt cannot penetrate our destiny. Doubt cannot penetrate our identity. We rebuke you, doubt, and we send you back to hell where you came from, and when doubt gets up off of us, let it get off of everything connected to us. You can't go with us any further. You can't move into this ministry. You can't move into this marriage doubt you can't go you're no longer welcomed here you can't move into this family doubt you cannot stay here because the presence of God has stepped in we receive you Jesus as continuous salvation sanctification coming to us now God make us more holy more righteous more beautiful and less like a reflection of what we've gone through. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We receive our freedom. And Father, if anyone's watching right now, and they're just dipping their toe in the water, I hope this word pulled them all the way in. I hope it submerged them, God. God, I pray that after this is done, that they would take the time to connect with us so that we can lead them in the prayer of salvation and they can begin this beautiful sanctification. God, thank you for allowing their heart to be pulled in the direction of Jesus. May they receive him as their Lord and their Savior, the one rescuer who can rescue them from anything they've gone through. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, family. You know you got to say it with me. Oh, I shared so much in my heart with you in this word, my own wrestling with doubt. And I'm not afraid to say that I've been wrestling with doubt. I'm not afraid to say it because I'm human. And one thing I did say when I started preaching and I didn't, I doubted seriously that this was a good idea, but I told God, I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm going to always keep it as 100 as I can because I want people to know they aren't alone. I hope that in some way as you were watching this that you felt a little less lonely and a lot more convicted 
to surrender that doubt so that you can see what springs up in the place where your doubt once lived. I'm personally going to sow into this word. We're going to take our tithes and our offerings, but for me, this is going to be something more personal and intimate, and I want to ask you to join me if you feel led. I want to sow into the place where doubt once lived. This word, this moment, is something that God brought to me, and now it's coming through me. But I don't want to miss it. I don't want to put the microphone down and go back to second guessing. I want to stay anchored to this word, and I want you to stay anchored to it too. So whatever a sacrifice is for you, I'm not going to call out a number. But maybe you sow on the level that doubt has cost you. If doubt has only cost you a little, then maybe you just sow a little. But if you have a feeling that doubt is costing you a lot, maybe you should sow into this word so that you can send a sign to doubt that there will be harvest in the place where you took up space. For those of you who are giving your tithes, that's 10% of your increase. It's our way of saying, God, every job, every gig, every opportunity that I have received may have come from a company or organization, but ultimately the gift and the talent came from you. There are instructions on the screen. I'm not gonna make this long. But if you're sowing, whether you're giving your tithes or you're giving a special offering connected to this word, I want you to find a way to lift it to heaven. If it's your phone, girl, fella, put me up in the air. That's fine. If it's your laptop, throw it in the air. If it's your TV, just tilt the screen up a little bit. Put your hand in the air. Because we want to make this an offering. An offering is something that says, I want to reach up to heaven with this. Heaven touched down, but heaven, you don't have to come any further. I'm going to reach up to heaven with this. And so I want you to put it in the air. Father, receive our offering. Receive our tithes. God, you keep touching down. Just when I'm ready to give up, just when I don't know what to do, you keep touching down. God, I felt you touch down in this place. You touch down in my soul. You touch down in my doubt. And Father, I'm offering this seed as as acknowledgement that I see you, I heard you, I received that word, God. Now I'm presenting this offering to you as a sign of my obedience to no longer being ruled and governed by doubt. Receive this offering, God, and build your church. May you continue to snatch souls out of the hands of doubt, souls out of the plans of the enemy. God, do with this seed, which only you can do, and that is turn it into transformed lives. God, thank you for this rich ministry that is not just changing lives, but it is feeding souls and helping those in need. God, thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing in the earth. Continue to build your church, and thank you for building me in the process. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, family. Man, I love you so much. I'm going to be walking this thing out. Would you all pray with me? I'm going to keep praying for you and with you. Next week is going to be just an incredible week for us with Woman Evolve. And God told me that I couldn't go into it holding on to this doubt that the only reason why I'm in this position is because of who my father is or because of what I've gone through. And I just want you to touch and agree with me that as we walk into Woman Evolve, and if you're gonna be there, I can't wait to see you, but as we walk into Woman Evolve, that God would help me to step fully into who he's called me to be. I'm gonna pray with you, you're gonna pray with me, and we're gonna keep activating until the wheels fall off. I love you, family. I'll see you next time.